Hi everyone. Oh, what a fun title. Let's break apart some labels. And it's not that we're going to shred them up into pieces. As product developers, it's always good to study labels, take a look at them. I always think that I started my, my career as a label reviewer. Not that I'm a label reviewer. I teach food science and label review is one of the things I teach. But I, do, I have done it for a wide variety of different industrial clients. And I used to do a little bit of it when I was with the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. But I always joke that um, I started my career as a label reviewer as a child because I would sit at my uh, breakfast table and stare at the labels on the packages and just think how interesting all of the stuff was on there. And it's so much easier now that uh, everything's online and everyone's walking around with the world's information in their smartphone. But uh, I'd always wonder, what is that ingredient with that weird name? And just uh, as a kid, it was just very fascinating to me. And so I usually, at this point in the semester when we're teaching in person, I ask the students to find an empty food package, um, something from the recycling bin perhaps, and bring it to class. And we're going to pass them around the room and do some label reviews. So um, we're going to go through that from a virtual perspective and uh, take a look at some of the tools that are available to you online from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to do some uh, label compliance reviews to see how the labels are standing up. So at the end of this video, you'll review some labels for basic compliance requirements related to the required and voluntary label declarations. And we'll use the CFIA industry labeling checklist for reviewing food labels. And so, beep, <laughs> I'm in my kitchen making videos and that was my stove beeping at me. Um, so I do expect at this point, if you haven't watched the video, uh, the video series related to all the different label claims or being able to make ingredient declarations or allergen declarations on labels, uh, this is more of a cumulative type assignment um, or um, cumulative type video where we're, we're pulling together all sorts of different skills. Um, so I may be prompting you to go and watch other videos if you haven't already as we're going along here. So indeed, we are using the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency as our reference document because again, we are teaching in Canada for Canadian food manufacturing. So get used to having it on your speed dial, if I can use that uh, bookmark it, because it's it's so incredibly useful as you are developing products or doing competitive analysis against other products in your category. So let's just jump out there. I, I, oh, you, you knew it was coming, didn't you? So just a reminder, um, when it comes to labeling, no person shall advertise any food, drug, cosmetic, or device to the general public as a treatment, preventive, or cure for any of the diseases, disorders, or abnormal physical states. And again, that's a uh, friendly reminder. And all the students at Niagara College are going to have it drilled in their heads. You can't go out in Canada and make statements about food products that are going to be related to improving health and wellness unless it's something that's validated and in the guide to food labeling for industry and the food and drugs regulation. So in general, we can't just go out and say all sorts of things about the food products. The other piece of the puzzle is no person shall label, package, treat, process, sell, or advertise any food in a manner that is false, misleading, or deceptive, or is likely to create an erroneous impression regarding its character, value, quantity, composition, merit, or safety. And honestly, this section of the Food and Drugs Act, section five, um, or is so constantly quoted because this is where if you've made a factual error, whether through negligence or through intent, um, if you've made an error on that label, this is likely going to be the piece of the law that they're going to come out and get you with. There are other elements to the law with respect to labeling, but you have to make sure that you're presenting things in a factual way. So I just went through my kitchen and you can see actually I Pardon me, I snapped some photos of stuff in my freezer. So we've got some chopped spinach here, um, no name brand. We've got a net weight. We've got a uh, grading standard. We've got a um, storage requirement. We've got the brand of the company that's there. We've got the standardized name for this product. We've got a nutrition facts table and that portion size at 75 grams. Well, um, some of this information, we've got to think about how it was derived. So 
Uh, something that I'd be looking up is, obviously, I'd be wanting to make sure that my grade standard for my chopped spinach was indeed meeting the Canada Grade A standard. And um, uh, doing grading is in another class, but uh, it's uh, the, the, the grading documents are well documented within the Safe Food for Canadians regulation lists. And what is that portion size? So I, again, I'm just going to jump right out here and oh come on web page that's fine it sodium reduction that's going to be one of the talks i'm going to give in a little bit here so food labeling requirements ah oh, you know what let's just jump out to the tab here food labeling requirements checklist this is the canadian food inspection agency's checklist for what is required on that label so uh, i realize uh, it's hard for me to flip back and forth but did we have a common name yes it was spinach it is not an exempted product. The common name was on the principal display. The common name letters were larger. Some of the checklist items here are for your graphic designer. And usually what you would do is have the label copy ready to go to a graphic designer. And then you would find a graphics and label design specialist who has this background also with the labeling requirements, but more from a are the font sizes correct? Is the principal display surface the correct size? They can help with that. Whereas you may, as a product developer or as a business owner, have the other piece of the role, making sure that the technical copy you provide is, is appropriate. So do you have the appropriate common name? Some food products in Canada are standardized. I'm sure you've seen it like the the chocolatey fudge covered coating uh, on cookies. That's a good example where it doesn't meet the standard of identity for chocolate. Certain products have standard identity and you need to make sure that it's complying with the standard of identity for that product. Some products though, uh, often multi-ingredient composed products, um, often don't have standards of identity. And so then it's up to you to give it a common name that's logical and makes sense, but um, you don't have to meet the standard. Net quantity, so we did see it was 300 grams. Is that net quantity present? Is it in the right units? Is it in the proper manner? In, in some cases, certain commodities have established, um, established uh, weights that are required for the food products. So for example, milk. You've, never, you've likely never seen milk being sold in a package of 400 grams milliliters because it comes in a very established packet size and so you need to be aware if your commodity has an established weight or volume requirement on its packaging so there are certain rounding issues there are there correct uh, bilingual symbols used for the weights are they in the appropriate language does the numerical portion meet the font face type uh, size requirements if optional Canadian units are there, then are they are they there and declared properly? So, for example, in some products, you can declare it by dozens or by uh, units. Uh, think of, uh, for example, a package of donuts. You can present it by units, but then you may also have to present it as a total weight. If optional U.S. gallons are present, are they identified properly? Ingredients and allergens. We've we've done a lot on this, but are they? Is the ingredients there? Is it an exempt single ingredient food? Um, are the ingredients in appropriate descending order of proportion by weight? We've done this in another slideshow, uh, but making sure that you're declaring things properly. Are you using appropriate plain language common names on your ingredients? Are they are components there? So those are the ingredients of ingredients. When your ingredient has ingredients itself, are you listing them properly? Have you both your sugars together properly? Are priority allergens, glutens, and sulfites listed properly? So either within the list of ingredients as a source of or in a cross-contamination statement, are they there at the are the end of the ingredients? And is it in English and French? I realize this course is being taught in English. And when I have students work on assignments, I say English only, but you would send it out for translation. And we'll have some discussion at a later point about how do you go about doing um, labeling and advertising translation. So are things appropriate locally? Located. So, for example, uh, an, uh, a nutrition facts table can't be on the bottom of a package except in, in a very few specific cases. And is it on one continuous surface with no intervening material? So, 
your list of ingredients and nutrition facts table can't be on the corner of a package such that you have to flip it back and forth to read the whole thing. Is it using the appropriate colors? And again, this is something that your graphic designer is going to help with properly. But are your characters in proper uppercase and lowercase is required with commas and so on? Um, proper use of fonts and so on. Um, name and principal place of business has to be on there. So you need to have the name of the company. Is it an imported product? And as such, does it have that imported by statement? Getting closer. I'm going through this really, really fast because I want to introduce you to this tool and I want to make sure that you go back to the guide to food labeling for industry to make sure that you are reading it yourself and applying it to the products and uh, uh, product development projects that you're working on specifically. Uh, again, some of this is very specific for graphic designers. Date marking is, is a best before date on there. So do you require a best before date? If it has a durable life of 90 days or less, then you may have different rules for what's, what's there. So long, uh, I'll, I should do a slide presentation just on best before dates rather, rather than trying to explain it here. Packaged on dates. So some products can have packaged on dates. Storage instructions. Oh, on our spinach, we had to keep frozen. Um, and so making sure that uh, the proper location for storage, keep refrigerated, keep frozen. For some products, an expiration date is required, but those are typically, when we think of expiry dates, um, again, I should have a slide presentation just on best before and expiry dates. But uh, typically expiration is just for foods for special dietary use. Is everything legible? About our nutrition facts table, we've, we've got a whole section on nutrition facts tables, but uh, just some of the quick checklist items is if your package is small and has a really small uh, available display surface of less than 15 centimeters square, then it may be exempt from uh, needing a nutrition facts table. Or if it's got a less than 100 centimeters square exemption as well, then you just have to have postal address and toll-free numbers so that people can access it if, if necessary. Now, that said, if there are certain claims, like uh, you're using artificial sweeteners, such as uh, asulfame potassium or uh, aspartame or so on, then you may have to have a nutrition facts table on that product, even though it is in a small orientation. Is it in the right direction? So is it on the outer package? So for example, if you have a package of cereal, you don't see the nutrition facts table on the, on the plastic bag inside the cereal. It needs to be on the outer package. And when you're opening that package, the nutrition facts table shouldn't be destroyed during normal opening of the package. Now that said, if it's a single serve package, that may be a different situation. Is it on one continuous surface of the available display panel? And is it in a, uh, in a form so that when you are viewing and reading the nutrition facts table, your product's not going to leak or spill. So think about, for example, having a pie um, your nutrition facts table, uh, you don't want to have to flip the pie over and smush the product to be able to read the nutrition facts table. Are you using the appropriate format? So in some cases, you've got a standard format with all the products. If you have a product that has six or more of the components as zero, then you can use a simplified format. Or if it's a single serving prepackaged product, you can use a simplified format. Sometimes you need to have a dual format, and this is where you have food products with different preparation styles. Uh, one of the most common dual format labels is a breakfast cereal, where you would have breakfast cereal itself and then breakfast cereal with an appropriate serving of milk. Because I'd say 95% of people eat their breakfast cereal with milk on top. You can, in some kinds, have an aggregate format label with different uh, amounts on the uh, serving size. And sometimes you'll have an infant six months of age or older. Uh, this aggregate, or jumping back to that aggregate format label, sometimes there's ingredients, for example, that are used in different ways. And it may make sense, for example, certain sauces. You may use it as a finishing sauce, or you may use it as a minor garnish. And as such, it may be worth having um, different amounts for the different applications. So. The contents, do we have the appropriate regulated reference amount? So is the is the serving size on the in, 
uh, nutrition facts table relative to the reference table of serving sizes, or does it correspond to the serving quantity within that product? So, so for example, let's say you're a chocolate bar, you may be um, having a reference serving size of 40 grams, but your chocolate bar may be 50 grams. It would be reasonable for the person to eat the entire 50 gram chocolate bar, therefore your serving size is a single serving container. Do you have all the uh, basic core nutrients on there? And then you have certain voluntary uh, nutrients that may be declared. Do you have any triggered nutrients? So for example, if you have a fish product and you say good source of omega-3 fatty acids, then you may have a triggered nutrient that needs to be declared on your nutrition facts table. Have you got the right units and percent daily values? And this is one reason why it's really useful to work with in um, database software like ESHA or Recipal to develop your nutrition facts table because it will do these units for you appropriately. In terms of your nutrition facts table, is it the right color, the right fonts? Again, the benefit of working with a uh, database software is that it's going to do that for you. Bilingual requirements, again, in most products, you have to have it in English and French. If your food product is irradiated, you have to have it um, labeled as such. That said, that's pretty uncommon. If you have sweeteners on your product, and this would include artificial sweeteners or non-caloric sweeteners, things like stevia, A-sulfame-K, aspartame, saccharin, and so on, you may need to have a additional requirements for that. Country of origin. So you may have requirements for that. And we have got to the bottom of the list. Woohoo! So let's just jump back to our PowerPoint here and just think really, really quickly. What are we going to do? We're going to go down that checklist and see, have we got everything here? I don't have everything in my photos here, but some key features that I'm looking at. One quarter of a package, 75 grams. Let's jump back out and see, do I have, this is my table of reference serving sizes. So that was a vegetable. What is a serving size of vegetable? 85 grams, fresh or frozen. So let's jump back to our PowerPoint. 85 grams is the reference serving size, but we've got 75 grams because this is a 300 gram package. Are we legit to do that? Absolutely, because we're putting it in a household measure that's realistic and it's well within that 50 to 200% uh, of the serving size. So that makes sense. Our serving size was 75 grams and some things, uh, we had a different slide presentation on compliance on the nutrition facts table and evaluating compliance, but oftentimes you'll do a quick check to see if the numbers add up. Now in this case, we're missing a large quantity of water, but there's nothing really glaring standing out here for me. Carbohydrate, three, three. And so if we also do a quick check in terms of calorie count, so three times, three times four would be 12 plus 16. No, that's fiber. So we would assume one of the grams is starch. So 12, 16, and fat is 0.5 grams, so we're at 4 grams, so 21 calories. And they have declared it at 25. And so it, the calorie count may be slightly off um, in terms of compliance. And that's something that you could be doing a, a more in-depth check on. Oh, actually, why am I viewing the PowerPoint from this format? Let's jump into the proper format here. Oh, we've got powdered milk. I think I bought this... Uh, during the early stage of the pandemic, and now I'm using it for making yogurt. I put a scoop of it into my own homemade yogurt. So powdered milk, we've got some uh, label claims on here. We see fat-free, fat-free. We have a 0% uh, percent declaration on our fat-free. Excellent source of protein, 9 grams. Now you may remember, if you're making an excellent source of protein uh, claim, you have to do... A bit more homework. You have to do that protein claim and you need to go through and do a PER calculation on that product. So elements within the nutrition facts table, if we jump out to the protein efficiency ratios, we remember that there were some calculations and I have a video for doing these calculations. 
that in the case of the milk protein, we can um, assume that it's all milk protein and we can do the, the calculation for the PER value to ensure that we've got a, um, a value of greater than 40 to make the excellent source of protein claim. Let's jump back to our PowerPoint again here. This time I'm going to remember to make the slide the right size. Woohoo! My, my kid said she wants to make a smoothie. So how about cereal? High in fiber. Where is our fiber at here? Fiber is at seven grams. Or so all sorts of information on this box. There's there's a there's a lot going on here. And we could have a lot of fun digging into this entire box of cereal, but let's just focus on the a very high fiber claim here and do a validation on that. Ooh, that's okay. That's the fun of being. Uh, that's the fun of being in work from homeland. And I keep telling, sorry, my camera is not on. My kid just said, Wait, "Is the camera on?" No, it's not on, but it's on recording right now. Uh, nutrient content claims. I must have closed the window. Let's double check our nutrient content claim for fiber, dietary fiber claims. How much do we need to make an excellent source of fiber claim? It's not an excellent source of fiber claim, very high source of fiber claim. It contains six, or, six grams or more fiber. Where are we at? Very high fiber. I'm the one who's saying excellent. They have the word incorrect. And it was six grams or more, and we are at seven grams. Good job, Kellogg's Grand Flakes. Bananas. Oh, you knew I was going to pull a fast one on you. Bananas are exempt because it's a single ingredient. It's a fruit and vegetable. It does have a product lookup code, and that's uh, 4011. And additional information about the product can be found um, from the manufacturer's sticker. However, it is an exempt product and does not require a nutrition facts table or any other additional labeling. Ooh, this one's fun. Ooh, check this out. This is a large bulk box of granola bars from Costco. And there are two types of granola bars. So because there are two types of product in here, they're using a composited label where they've got two nutrition facts table groups in one product. And my kid is asking if she can have a snack, and yes, she can. She's a teenager. Um, so the, the product has the external nutrition facts table, but then it's got, because this is a smaller package, it's allowed to have the linear label format, um, such that when you open the package, it is a single serve, so it can be destroyed on uh, uh, on opening of the package, but it's it's likely to remain legible during the opening of that package. It is a per 40 gram serving. And so this is going to be per package. We don't need to worry about the, the reference serving size because the package itself is 40 grams. And we see some voluntary nutrient declarations in terms of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids on there because of the omega-3 label on there. Oh, check that out. The method of production claim, peanut free. Interesting. Lots of, lots of stuff on all of these different packages. Oh, where's the nutrition facts table? Because this is a single ingredient product, and if you really consider it, cinnamon's not going to be contributing in a major way nutritionally when added into a food product because you're adding it in such small quantities for most recipes. As such, it does not require a nutrition facts table but, oh, I also was snooping around in the spice drawer and I'm working on the uh, project with the third years where we've been making Caesars in class. It's been a ton of fun to drink Caesars in class. We are usually drinking Caesars without any alcohol, by the way, just to, just to let you know if, if you see us um, in the sensory room having a Caesar, that's alcohol free. But uh, wait a second, the cinnamon didn't have to have a nutrition facts table, but why does this one have to have one? Well, it's a multi-component spice. And because of all of the different multiple components and the fact that it is 
uh, reasonably high source of sodium for the portion size, then it does require a simplified nutrition facts table. So, um, because of, especially because of the sodium content in particular. But it can go for a, a simplified format. And in ASHA, you have the capabilities of dropping it back to a simplified format under the label formatting tab. Here's another one that has a simplified format. And this is a rose water, as we call it, golab. And it is um, a product that has zero on everything. And as such, it can have a simplified label. Because it's a product that many people don't really understand, um, you can have a voluntary label on something that doesn't necessarily require a label. Ooh, here we go. Captain Highliner's Fish. And what we can't see here, it is, uh, it, I, yeah, I must have cropped the photo, but it, it had a, it had a declaration on omega-3 fatty acids, and it had a no artificial colors or preservatives statement. Because the fish fillets are somewhat irregular in shape, they were uh, they would do it based off of a, uh, an average weight for the fish fillets, and then make sure that within the packaging size itself, that there's at least uh, 500 grams of fish fillets. You'll note 500 grams, if there's four fish fillets, um, four times 125 would be 500 grams, but they've declared their fish fillet at 127. And that's, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the ac uh, reasonably accurate uh, declaration because they would, because of the irregularity of the portion size, they would likely skew the net weight on the package a, a gram or two above the, uh, the declared weight, just to make sure that within the variance on those packages, everything's good. But because of the omega-3 uh, fatty acid declaration on the front of the box, then there was an omega-3 declaration on the nutrition facts table. And in this case, we don't have any additional vitamins declared, but um, I think we may have noted that on certain products, uh, you can make a voluntary claim for additional nutrients. Oh, this one was fun. Um, I bought this chocolate bar for my for my teenage kid who keeps coming and interrupting my video. And uh, <laughs> her father, her her cousin was with us for about a month, and um, I kept encouraging her to speak Farsi with her cousin. And I said, "Here, it's a chocolate bar for you for for speaking Farsi." And this says "Salam," and it's both in Arabic and Farsi to say "Hi" or "Peace." And this is made by Peace Peace by Chocolate, which is a, a Nova Scotia-based chocolate company run by a. A uh, family uh, that originally came to Canada from Syria, and it's a great company, and I highly recommend you take uh, take a look and find their products. And I've I pulled this this package um, partly because it was fun to read the nutrition facts table, and and part of me is tempted to uh, send them an email because the serving size for chocolate indeed is going to be half a bar. This is a ninety two gram chocolate bar. And the reference serving size for chocolate is 40 grams. So this is acceptable in terms of the serving size. And it is a scored chocolate bar. And as such, it can be a reference serving size. Now, that said, they've got a composite label where they have a per serving, which uh, should be, and I say should with an asterisk, it should be half of the weight of the chocolate bar. So 46 grams. And already you may be saying, wait a second, you don't have to go very far here to see there might be a, a slight problem here because the weight of the chocolate bar is 46 grams and we've got a, a problem because the total fat and the total carbs and protein alone are not adding up to 46 grams. So let's just pull up a calculator here just for a quick check. 33 plus 45 plus 7 equals 85 grams. Something's wrong because the the variance on this label is such that that is a per serving. And if we do the same in terms of the per container, that per container on the chocolate bar is 92 grams. And we see on the composite label, pardon me, I've got my hard drive attached here, 66 plus... 
66 grams of total fat. I'm not worrying about the minor nutrients in terms of micronutrients. So 66 plus 91 plus, uh, so 91 includes the total sugars as well as other carbohydrates and then plus 14. So the total chocolate bar in terms of the nutrition facts table is reading 171 grams. And as such, this calorie value here, I am extremely confident is not accurate um, in terms of the weight of this bar. Um, and it's, let's say this was 90 grams of fat. Just uh, immediately when I saw the nutrition, uh, the calorie count per container, let's say it was 90 grams of fat or let's see, let's see, yeah, pardon me, 92 grams of fat times nine, assuming this was just a bar of cocoa butter and the highest per gram calorie count possible, there's no way that this chocolate bar could be 970 calories based off of, based off of the um, compositional analysis for chocolate, period. And so, these are the sorts of things that are worthwhile looking up, and it's it's always good to do this sorts of double checks and have a, a label review person, um, whether that's a regulatory affairs specialist or just someone who's well studied in the guide to food labeling for industry to do some double checking on your labels before you go about publishing them. Oh, here's my last label, and you and. Um, this is this is me being silly because this uh, you, I realize that this is veggie greens and it's where you take a scoop of green powder and you mix it into your smoothie or you mix it into a glass of water and it looks like pond scum and you drink it and and you turn the package around and you're like well I I drink this this is a food therefore it says it's land sea and cruciferous vegetables but is this a nutrition facts table? And the answer is no, because this is not a food. This is a natural health product. And that's going to be our next theme for those of you who are in the, the nutrition course at Niagara College is that we're going to dig into some um, natural health products that look like foods, they act like foods, but they are not foods. And how do we go about doing labeling for that? And how do we go about doing formulation and any sort of claims with respect to it? We can't see it because there's a bit of glare on my photo, but there's uh, NPN and then a, a number behind that and that just stands for natural product number and it does mean that this product has been registered with the uh, with the Health Canada Natural Health Products Directorate and that this product has been registered as a, as a health product and it is not a food. It is regulated differently and they have a different standard of how you can make claims against these products. So I'm going to leave you with that because it is something, uh, perhaps if you are into health or nutrition type products, you may have products like this that the moment you go and look for the nutrition facts table, you're like, well, wait a second, there is no nutrition facts table because this is not a food. So get to know your guide to food labeling for industry because it is, it, while it's not the most exciting document in the world, it is extremely useful. And the more you dig into it, the better you're going to be as a product developer and as uh, someone who's going to um, be able to quickly identify the, 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 the hints and the, the secrets behind all the labels in the food products that you're eating on a daily basis. All right. My kid is staring at me. She wants to make a smoothie and she wants to turn on the blender and I am sitting in the kitchen. So I got to call this video quits. Ask good questions. We'll talk to you again real soon.